Hey everyone, this is Mike Kramer of Mod Capital. Today is uh, Tuesday, May 7th. It's around uh, 6 o'clock New York time. U.S. markets are closed. It's going to be a very boring week here in the U.S. when it comes to economic data. You can see about the most exciting thing we have between now and Friday is University of Michigan, although that will all change next week when we start getting things like the NFIB, Small Business Optimism Index, PPI, and then on CPI will come on the 15th. So enjoy the lull uh, while you get the chance. Most of the uh, this most of the big action will be taking place uh, in the UK over the, the rest of this week with the Bank of England rate decision coming on the 9th. and then on the tenth we're going to get the, uh, the GDP numbers for the first quarter preliminary. We're looking for a 0 0.4 up from a negative 0 0.3 year over year. We're looking for a zero percent up from a negative 0 0.2. Currently, there's no expectations for. Uh, any change in policy for this meeting in the ninth, you can see that the first rate cut is looking like it's going to come around the time we get to August, uh, with the second rate cut potentially coming by the time we get to December. Uh, odds have been sort of shifting around here regarding the path of rate cuts. You can see that at one point we were only looking for maybe one rate cut in 2024, and now the odds have begun to shift back down to where we're looking at maybe two rate cuts. And we're going to be listening very closely to what uh, the Bank of England says uh, this week to see if they can give us any clue in terms of uh, where rate cuts are likely going thereafter. Obviously, we'll probably get a better sense as well after we start looking at some of this GDP data and then, of course, inflation data as it comes. For that, we'll just start off with the British uh, two-year at this point. Obviously, uh, a more hawkish-sounding uh, BOE would certainly lead to the, uh, the two-year potentially breaking higher. Uh, you can see that basically all we've been doing uh, over the last several weeks, really, uh, is going back to the end of 2023, has been consolidating sideways. We've been sort of flip-flopping back and forth between the 50-day moving average. Notice that when below it, it's acted as resistance, and when above it, it's acted as support. So right now, we're sitting on support. Uh, not really surprising, I guess, given that we're going to be getting this news uh, coming in the next couple of days. Uh, you'll be watching here with a break of the 50-day, potentially setting up a drop to around 421. Obviously, anything below 4121 takes you outside of the triangle uh, and potentially means that the two-year actually begins to move lower. When you look at the British pound, uh, that's uh, been strengthening a little bit versus the dollar. The 50-day simple moving average has been serving as a resistance level more recently. Notice that we got up to that level more recently and we've started to back off. Also, it looks like we may have broken a short-term uptrend that was in place that may have formed here in the British pound. So right now we're going to watch to see again how this sort of plays out. If it is the case where you start seeing the British two-year going down, uh, likely on this idea that you're going to be getting more rate cuts sooner, that's likely going to signal that the British pound is going to start weakening versus the dollar as some of those interest rate differentials continue to widen out between Fed policy, uh, Bank of England policy, and ECB policy. That's going to continue to sort of move around uh, where these currencies are going. Because again, what we've generally been seeing is a, weak, a strengthening of the U.S. dollar across the board. Uh, while the euro hasn't broken down yet, uh, it still looks like there's a good chance that we're going to get that move lower. Uh, at this point, all we've done is retrace to the 50-day moving average in the in the euro. So as long as that continues to hold as resistance, the 50-day moving average is trending lower. And when you look at the dollar index, it actually bounced right off the 50-day moving average uh, and is beginning to move higher. Again, I had thought there was a bull flag. Uh, that obviously didn't work out. It does move higher. It won't be because of a bull flag. But again, that uh, there's still a bias and upward momentum uh, to the dollar index potentially moving up from here. Um, when we look at the FTSE, the last time we had talked, uh, we were talking about this consolidation here and the potential for the FTSE to rise up to around 82.72. Uh, it's actually surpassed that at this point and has gone on to increase to around 83.22, so a little bit further than we expected. Uh, you can see, though, that the FTSE is getting pretty overbought here on an RSI. Uh, we're getting to the point also where we're extending beyond the upper Bollinger Band. Uh, and historically, as we know, and through the work and other indices that we've done, typically speaking, when we see this overbought condition uh, met where you get uh, the price above the upper Bollinger Band, 
and the RSI above 70, it typically results in some sort of consolidation, either by pulling back or like we saw in this period of time, just a sideward price action. So it wouldn't be surprising at all at this point to see the uh, UK FTSE really begin to consolidate sideways here. Another signal could be that we've started to see, you know, copper prices uh, potentially stall out a little bit. You can see that copper actually got overbought, a very similar condition to what we're seeing in the FTSE right now. Uh, and you can see that we pulled back down and started to consolidate sideways. Again, I think copper and the FTSE have a good relationship with one another over time. You can see that they tend to follow each other pretty closely. So uh, if it is the case that, uh, and you can almost see how copper sort of leads and trades a little bit ahead of the FTSE. So if it is the case that we're seeing copper prices pulling back a little bit, it wouldn't be unusual as well to see the FTSE pull back some uh, in the next couple of days to kind of consolidate and regroup. Uh, the DAX has powered higher over the last couple of days. In fact, it's moved almost right back to its highs. Uh, again, it was looking like there was some pretty strong resistance forming in the DAX in this area. That clearly uh, cleared it. That that clearly uh, didn't hold as resistance, and we began to see the index moving higher. The DAX, however, is not as overbought as the uh, as the FTSE at this point. You can clearly see the RSI is only at 62. It's also uh, even though you have the upper Bollinger band broken, I think it's more of a scenario where you could see the DAX actually rise along the upper Bollinger band as opposed to it being sort of in this consolidation pullback phase. It wouldn't really be until the RSI gets above 70 that again, I would be sort of thinking that we're gonna see some sort of pullback or some period of sideways consolidation. But again, right now what we're looking at here in the, in the DAX is whether or not it can continue to keep the upward momentum going the next big level of uh, resistance comes right here at 18,440. Uh, you can see that basically what we've done at this point is retraced nearly all of the declines we've seen so far. We're well beyond the 78.6% extension. So at this point, it looks like if we continue to move up, uh, the next level is obviously going to be to probably take out the highs that we saw uh, back here at the beginning of April. When we look at the NASDAQ, uh, a little bit of a different situation just because uh, we haven't exceeded the 78.6% extension. In fact, the NASDAQ got up to the 78.6% extension, and that's where it stopped rising. Uh, it also got back to this lower trend line here of this ascending broadening wedge pattern that we broke below uh, not too long ago. So at this point, the NASDAQ almost has this look of what appears to be a retest of a broken trend line uh, and could not really clearing all the Fibonacci levels that were sort of important here. Uh, I mean, clearly the next big level that we would see in the, uh, in the NASDAQ would be at the all time highs again. And it's not to say that we can't see the NASDAQ rise to the all time highs again. It's just that there's a little bit more uh, level. There's some more levels of resistance here in the NASDAQ than what you're seeing, let's say, uh, in the DAX. Uh, and again, as I pointed out in a prior video as well, there is that potential bull flag pattern that's formed in the DAX. We don't, we don't have that same sort of setup here in the NASDAQ, at least at this point, you don't have what appears to be a very clear and concise pattern as a bull flag. So I would be watching this level very closely at 18,150 because we have lots of big gaps. Uh, we have lots of big gaps to fill down to around 17,550 or so. Uh, when we look at the S&P, it's also a little bit more of a tricky situation. Just like the NASDAQ, there's an area here with a lot of resistance built up. We're hitting the 78.6% uh, retracement level. There's also a gap here at 5,200 that's in the process of being filled or it's been filled already. You can see we got there today. Also, we have this uh, trend line here that also kind of comes into play. And we also know that 5200 and the S&P 500 is the call wall, which from an option perspective suggests that above 5200, you might begin to see uh, call holders of, of the options begin to become sellers. So this is a sort of a slightly different uh, scenario, I think, than what you're seeing in the DAX, 
uh, again, I think the DAX just has an easier path higher. It doesn't mean that uh, it's also much closer to the previous all-time high than both the NASDAQ and the S&P are, at least at this point. You know, um, there just seems to be a little more work that needs to be done here with a little bit more uh, resistance in front of it. Then finally on the Dow, we're kind of right now, again, looking at an area where we can see some consolidation forming. Uh, on the Dow, we haven't also seen uh, quite the same level of retracement that we've seen uh, in the NASDAQ and in the S&P. In fact, on the Dow, all we've done is retrace 61.8% of the initial declines. And so what this kind of says in a way is that you haven't really seen the S&P or the, the, the Dow or the NASDAQ really get past the point in time where you can say, okay, this is more than a retracement that we've seen. In fact, all we're doing right now is retracing. And uh, again, this would be a, an indication that perhaps, you know, we kind of get to a point here where we're going to potentially see a move lower, uh, filling some of these lower gap levels that were left behind as the market moved up following the FOMC meeting last week. So right now, I think the the setup in things like the Dow, the S&P and the NASDAQ and the FTSE sort of favor uh, a consolidation or a pullback phase, while in the DAX, it just seems a little bit more favorable for potential further upside there just because it's cleared so many key levels of resistance already. Uh, and that's really all I have uh, for you today. Again, I think next week there's going to be a lot more stuff going on uh, and we'll have a lot more to cover at that point. Anyway, have a great rest of your day and we'll see you again soon. Bye.